So my name is Ricardo Alvarez. I'm the uh, Regional Director for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, representing the uh, Commissioner of Agriculture, Nikki Freed. Um, I have here on, to my left, I have uh, an amazing panel of gentlemen who are experts in their field when it comes down to crop management and sustainability within crop management. To my left, I have here Naeem. I have, uh, and Naeem represents uh, Telesense. I have Krishna, who is from Crop and Technology, as well as Josh from Ag Analytics, and Chris Higgins from Port Americas. I'm going to ask these gentlemen to go ahead and introduce themselves and just, you know, talk about what they do, you know, briefly, and then we'll go on from there to do our uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead with you, Naeem. Go ahead and start. Okay, my name is Naeem Zafar. I am the founder and CEO of Telesense. Telesense is a company which is focused on post-harvest grain storage. So after you harvest your grain, it never improves in quality. The question is, you have to make dozens of decisions. When do you sell it? When do you fumigate it? When do you blend it? And also in transport, a bunch of bad things happen, especially on barges. So we're using IoT, Internet of Things technology, plus machine learning, to not only monitor alert, but also predict so you can make smart decisions. So that's what Telesense is all about. We have about 400 customers, 2,800 sensors deployed in many regions of the world. Nice, thank you. Uh, Krishna? Uh, hi, uh, this is Krishna, I represent Cropin. So Cropin is a AI and data-led ag tech B2B platform, so we always work with intermediaries. Uh, today on our platform, we, ha we have got 2.1 million farmers, 5.4 million acres, we manage close to 386 different crops, 3,662 different varieties on our platform uh, in these 46 countries. Uh, we are based out of Bangalore. We are 185 people organization, and we, we are Series B funded, and we are now raising our Series C as well. So this is pretty much what we do. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Josh. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Woodard, CEO of Ag Analytics. So Ag Analytics is a farm management platform. Uh, we also do a lot of work in the insurance and uh, finance arena. Um, I actually come at this from a totally different perspective probably than a lot of people. So um, I'm actually trained as, a, as an ag economist um, and was a professor at Cornell, associate professor there when we spun off the company. Um, my background really was more in crop insurance and actuarial science. So we had built a platform and had millions of acres enrolled on it um, and basically building tools to better predict risk and better make farm management decisions, but also we had this uh, work that we were doing in insurance for several years. We've developed, you know, we've developed several uh, programs currently sold, sold in the market in federal crop insurance. And then I'm also an expert reviewer for uh, the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation. So. Nice. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Chris. <clears throat> okay, my name is Chris Higgins. I'm the co-founder and president of Hort Americas, as well as the founder of Urban Ag News. At Hort Americas, we're a wholesale supply company that focuses on the controlled environment ag space. So growers producing using controlled environment ag techniques. Our specialties are in nutrients, substrate management, and lighting management, and, uh, but we also supply everything between seeding and harvesting. Um, based in Dallas, Texas, we work with growers throughout North America. Great, thank you, and a uh, round of applause to everyone for being here, thank you so much. Thank you for our panel. So let's get this uh, question started. Chris, going back to you, um, so explain to us, how can uh, CEAs help establish healthier growing environments for both production and workers? Well, let's start with the worker part first. Um, See, first, let's, let's define CEA. CEA can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, it could be anything from using a high tunnel to reduce, the, uh, to reduce the amount of rain or pest infestation that you might get on a given crop, all the way to a tissue culture facility or a very high-tech vertical farm like we saw in presentations earlier today. Nice. Um, in some cases, labor, labor is what a lot of farmers that I work with are really more focused in on. Um, if we look at situations going on in California, we have a shortage of ag labor, and our ag labor is getting older. So by utilizing different CEA strategies to grow crops like soft fruits, uh, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, we can, we can uh, cultivate the crop in a different way where we elevate the crop and make our aging labor force just as efficient as what they were when they were younger, nice. or close to as efficient. And then we can go all the way through to, to using a completely controlled environment with either robotics or labor assist robots to actually make that more efficient. So it really depends on how you define CEA and what crops you're defining it for. What does CEA stand for? Controlled Environment Agriculture. Perfect. Um, so 
Chris, and how, how does that also help with um, the production cycle of it? Like, um, I, you mentioned with, with, uh, with workers, um, but with the production cycle itself, like, how, how, does that, how does that really make it, or how does that establish a healthier environment? It should make your production cycle more predictable, right? Depending on the level of technology, and that's usually the level of investment you make, you should be able to give yourself more predictability and more consistent production throughout the crop cycle. Perfect. And that is really based on investment. <laughs> yeah, as always. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, so, Josh, uh, please uh, tell us, how can, how can we better understand insurance risk, the impact of insurance risk, and how that helps uh, producers' profitability? Sure. So, well, insurance and risk management is really critical to any business, of course. And you don't buy insurance, actually. The, the direct result of buying insurance doesn't necessarily mean that your profit goes up. Well, the reason your profit can go up is it allows you to make investments that you can't otherwise make. Okay. Right? So it's really interesting. I work mostly in the U.S., but if you look at the international uh, sort of market in some of the developing countries, the problem that we have here oftentimes is, say, over-application of nitrogen. In, those, in a lot of other areas, they have the opposite problem where they don't apply enough. And the question is why? Well, mm -hmm. because they don't have the financing. And why don't they have the financing? A lot of times it's because there's not insurance markets available. So, um, you know, in, in the U.S., I mean, historically, you know, we have this large insurance program that was not really created with a lot of those thoughts in mind. It's a very critical program um, for promoting investment. And that's one of the reasons in the U.S. we have the environment that we have and the, and the level of technology that we have. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I think it is, you know, what we found is that there are probably some improvements, improvements to make in insurance. So it ends up that uh, in order to make improvements to allow for more conser better conservation practice use and so on and so forth and to be able to price it, the types of technology that you need are, you know, the data technologies that are coming online or have been online that we can now use to actually estimate what is the risk at the farm level integrating all this information, which is what we do. That's what we focus on. So for example, we're working with uh, national corn growers, some environmental groups, um, and insurance companies on developing uh, basically conservation amendments to the federal crop insurance program. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about, about some of that um, as well. So. Okay, great, great. Um, Krishna, uh, how does digitalization and AI <coughs> enable smallholder farmers to get access to capital? Um, speak a little bit of how that works um, in developing countries, but also let us tell us how that would work here in the U.S. and how it works with our smaller farmers here. Yeah. So if you look it up in any developing nations, the farmers are very, very small. They are not into a banking system, so there is no digital record or transaction history. They are like a bureau company create a civil or experience score for when they go for a lending, and none of the banks really wants to go and lend to them because the ticket size are very, very small, and that's not. Uh, it's not a viable business for them because the cost of, of operation to manage those kind of a small tickets is very, very high. So one of the challenges, while we are working with the farming companies, seed production companies, uh, agrochemical companies, uh, uh, development agencies and government, but we also started working with the banking insurance because we felt if the capital doesn't get infused in this market, the life of a farmer is not going to evolve because you will not have enough money cash flow to really uh, do a lot of experiment at their farm to impact their quality and the yield. So we, we used machine, and then in 2017, we set up a small lab uh, where we give a challenge to, can we create a virtual income statement for the farmer who is not into the you know, uh, uh, mainstream banking system? And farmer doesn't have a digital record. So what we did was, we started looking at every pixel in India, uh, 10 by 10 meter, I started giving a tag to it using machine learning that which crop was grown on this pixel in the last three years, build a historical database, and then understand what, can, what was the health, so analyze the health, and then predict the yield on top of it and create an economic value for that pixel. Now that 10 by 10 meter pixel rolls out to an a acre that is a 44 such pixels. And actually you have now a virtual income statement of a farmer. Now when he goes to a bank, the bank has a confidence that, okay, there was no risk. He, and he let's say, got $1,000 of uh, revenue and probably, uh, and then he has got some other revenue stream, so I can give him a one lakh rupees of a loan, so, sorry, $2,000 of a uh, loan. So we are trying to uh, help them to get this uh, data as a score to the bank so that he can come and easily underwrite a loan to him. So we are, uh, we are working with the Rabobank, we are working with many of the Indian banks. We are also working in the US 
So one of the uh, company who is lending in Mexico to the Mexico farmers, they are using our product to underwrite a loan to them. So that, that's the beauty of uh, AI and machine learning. Without going on the ground, you can actually create a virtual income statement for the farmer and make them bankable. And that's, that's the turning phase for the smallholders. Great. Yeah. So besides the technology gap, what's another barrier to entry for small farmers to get access to this type of information or to, to, have, this, to have this data on hand to be able to then go to a bank and get a loan? So today, the farmer, farmer, farmer doesn't have to have that data. So mm -hmm. there is a government land record which is attached to every plot. Okay. Now, when they reach to a bank, they know there is a survey number to that plot, and they ping that plot to a cropping platform, uh, and then they get all the information of the risk around it. So there's a cost of operation comes down for the bank, mm -hmm. and that's why they want to, now they're looking at this as a viable business. So they don't have to go multiple times to visit the farms, which is a cost again to service that kind of a loan. So the bank, the moment farmer needs uh, capital, he's going to a bank, and then bank is able to get his uh, information as a score from, not from the civil, but from the crop and our experience. Great, yeah. thank you. We thank do you. work with the bureaus and the civil uh, uh, experience, uh, and then uh, Equifax to build the scores. OK, yeah. excellent. Thank yeah. you. appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Naeem, uh, please uh, give us an example of use cases or trends <coughs> in post-harvest grain storage. So like I was saying earlier, once you harvest your grain, you have a, as a grower, you need to figure out when to sell it. And often you you're even sometimes make a sale before the timing is right because you don't know what the quality will be. So what we're using is using data and technology so give him that comfort because the, all the decision he has to make, store it or sell it, when to fumigate it, when to blend it. You get an order, let's say you have uh, barley. You get an order from a beer company of 10,000 tons of barley. Now this could be a co-op, not a farmer. So you have it stored in 97 locations 135 bins, which seven bins should you empty? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it depends on many factors. Mm -hmm. What is the spec, what the uh, company ordered? What's the quality of those barley in each location? What's the labor availability? What's the logistics availability? So you, and what will be the quality of those bins three months, six months, nine months down the road? If you knew, you can make a very smart decision. Mm -hmm. So our company, the problem we are trying to solve is that. To give you data so you can make smart decisions, and because farmers are running on a very thin margin, and we all know that world population is going up 28 percent in the next 30 years, the irrigable land is not. So something has to give. Okay, true. Thank you. Um, so this question now is for the whole group, and I'll just uh, ask. Uh, Josh or Chris to start first. Uh, I guess, Josh, you go ahead and start first. And the question for the group is, how can producers best leverage IoT to produce higher yields? And what do you recommend be implemented first? Yeah. So, well, first, it's not just about higher yields, actually. And it's not just about what the, what the producers can do. So, um, you know, really finding ways that you can utilize these technologies to create efficiencies is, I think, a, as big of an opportunity as, as any. So to reduce your inputs in the right places at the right times to get the right uh, outputs, you know, outcomes that you want. So, um, you know, it used to be that, it, this is just my observation, but it, when I looked out and saw a lot of the models that were being used in industry, a lot of them were process-based models, and th they're, they're really nice for science, but they're really difficult to work with, whereas nowadays we have enough data that, you know, we can layer it together and actually apply machine learning and AI and, you know, advanced statistical techniques to, to really drill down and then operationalize those. So it's actually a really hard problem to solve. That's one of the problems that we've solved. Um, and, you know, certainly other people are, are working on it. But I think also what you're going to see is, and we can talk about this a little more later, is I think, um, you know, use of these technologies along the financial supply chain. I think there's a lot of opportunities for that that is wide open right now. So That's great. That's amazing. And, and Josh? Uh, yeah, from a from a production standpoint, let's talk about from a grower's perspective. I think it's you know really knowledge is power. Right. So, I think one of the things we first have to start with is giving growers access to more knowledge. And we've seen again presentations this morning that kind of outlined how that is happening, and then figuring out how that access to power applies in some rural areas. <coughs> and this not just outside of the United States, but inside the United States as well. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that I see um, is that many parts of ag producing USA don't have really good internet access. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at taking IoT and how that's going to apply to the farmer or to the grower, depending on the, uh, the application, um, the first thing is getting them access to the internet. 
The second thing is helping them collect and manage that data and then empowering them in ways in which they can use that data to make better cultivation decisions. And usually thinking that there is a technology gap with farmers, especially when we talk about small to medium sized farmers. Um, well, what, what would be the best method for them to access this information? Is it because, you know, often they don't even have like email accounts yeah. you know, or, you know, even Wi-Fi, as you're mentioning, or Internet service. Um, what, what's, what is the best method for them to be able to get this access? Well, I think, you know, everybody's going to have access to their email accounts, but the speed at which that happens. Um, so I, I think that's one of the things we need to keep in mind as we're, as we're making this data avail available, is how can we make this data available in, in packages, if you will, that are smaller and go through low, low speed internet connections mm. to start with, right? Because you probably have data at your office Correct. or at your house, but how does that apply when you're out in the field? Um, I, was, I was sharing with people this morning that I was getting text messages and I know many of these guys have computer systems that they're running with. They can text me because they're out in the field not sitting behind the desk. So how we use texting and how we use those different teams to send alerts or to make them aware of different things that are going on, I think is where we start. Great, thank you. Uh, Krishna? So I think, you know, uh, if you look at smallholder market, they don't have an email account, they don't have an internet, they don't have a smartphone, they don't know how to read. And we are talking about in India itself, 140 million farmers then add Southeast Asia, Africa, China, and other part of the world. What, what are best work for us when we are working in those markets? We do work in Europe and uh, US as well, but here it's easier because they, everybody has a smartphone and internet and email. In those markets, you know, they don't know how to input the IoT data or a satellite data or any kind of a complex uh, information we are trying to provide. What they need, I mean, we are trying to provide the information in a local language on their SMS because they don't have internet and they have a basic phone, feature phone, right? <clears throat> now, if you tell them that you know, the temperature is so much and the soil moisture is so down, they don't know what to do with that information. Now, to give you an example, if you are a potato farmer, and if we detect on that particular uh, geotag, tomorrow there's going to be a frost attack at, let's say, 5 in the morning, then the information you send to the farmer that, you know, this evening you need to sprinkle water on your farm so that the uh, frost attack will not damage your potato. They need that simple information. They need what time to irrigate because you can measure the ET, ET value from their farms. You can tell them that these are, these are the areas of your farms which are not doing well, maybe better fertigation is required. So they need actionable insight in their local language and not with too much technology barriers. So this is how we are trying to improve the per acre value for the smallholder market uh, where we operate uh, mostly. That's yeah. great. Yeah, that's very important. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Naim, tell us how to leverage IoT. Yeah, I think the good news is that you know, some of the points made were very good. You can compress the data, you can use simple SMS, <coughs> but there are a couple of other mega trends which are in our favor. Hmm. One is that the next generation of farmers and growers are much more tech savvy. The third generation, the next generation is coming in, and they're hungry for this. They're not afraid of it. So as we transition is happening, we're dealing with that. And second thing is there's a uh, pull for as 5G technology gets rolling worldwide slowly starting next year and LoRa. So there are companies that are rolling our rural internet access, company like IoT America, we, are, we partner with them. So they're coming up hubs using LoRa technology when you can have 20, 30, 50 mile broadcast. So slowly the whole rural area is being connected. There's a push going on in other countries, not just in the U.S. So long-term picture is uh, rather positive. I'm excited. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I think we all are. Um, so, Chris, um, tell us, uh, in what ways can can we... Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Yep, actually, this is my question. <laughs> uh, in what ways can CAs help raise the yields for producers? The CA is going to... It automatically helps raise it because it makes the crop more predictable. Right? So most of the time when we look at field production or we look at outdoor production, we're, we're gambling that the weather is going to be on our side. We're, we're gambling that there's not going to be any pestilence. Right? We're, we're, we're taking all of these risks. What CEA does, and again, depending on the type of investments that's made, is help us reduce those risks along the way. So just allowing us to be more predictable, allowing us to uh, add certain controls and certain certainties that we did not have um, at, our, you know, at our disposal before. 
So I think that, that it's a pretty simple answer. It's just reducing the exposure to risk is why CEA exists. Would you say that increases also the demand on farmers to have a greater competency when it comes down to their, 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 their skill, you know, their craft? I would say, yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely a, a competency in a certain way. Sure. It, it may be a certain set of skills that one didn't have before that they may need to have, and that may be a certain set of computer knowledge. Mm -hmm. It may be a certain set uh, of knowledge and maintenance of your equipment. But the cropping knowledge, if you're working with a second or third generation farmer, they're, they're already there. They just need to know how to use the equipment to their advantage. Okay. And what would be like uh, the most effective uh, method for a CA? Is it, is it vertical grows? Is it... Um... That, I don't think there is an answer to that. Okay. You know, I think even my, my answer to IoT, it really depends on where you're located. And I guess the way I like to look at CEA is the decisions on how you should invest in CEA should be based on the geography in which you're building your farm, the type of crop in which you are attempting to grow, and the natural and human resources you have access to. Excellent. So depending on all of those different parameters, any of the CEA solutions could work, and then some of them won't work, right? Interesting. Yeah, so it just depends on where, when, and who and what. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Josh, uh, how can predictive analytics be leveraged to help better understand the potential of crop immersions? So that's a good question. This is actually a perfect year to ask it. So as you know, we've had historic uh, flooding in the Midwest. Um, so that's been a really challenging year for, I think, farmers, but also a lot of other uh, parts of the sort of financial supply chain. I think of a lot, a lot of this problem from the perspective of insurance companies and, and banks as well. Um, for crop emergence, there's actually a really interesting application there where if you're able to, you know, sorry, it sounds like someone's uh, <laughs> playing heavy metal in the background. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, like for example, we're working on some models where we're combining IoT data that's coming off of farms with satellite data to be able to back out, you know, with weather data and other data sets to be able to back out when something was actually planted, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, that has a lot of uses, for example, with insurance companies. If, if your claim is late planted, well, it might be really hard to find, you know, those needles in the haystack to monitor, to monitor that. Um, so, but as of right now, the insurance companies, I, I think, by and large, are not really, you know, using those kinds of ideas to, to try to tackle those problems. So, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for things like that. You know, we're also doing a lot of work with different banks on, uh, developing, so, okay, we all want to track and figure out what is the economic case for conservation. We would all like to be able to track those practices, you know, from IoT to wherever, uh, if you want to create a premium for the mar in the market for that, for example. Um, but there's not really agreed upon frameworks that, you know, banks really would look at and say, these are metrics that I would incorporate into my rating system as such, or in the same thing for insurance companies. It may sound not totally exciting, but I, I can tell you that um, to get penetration in a lot of these things in the market, um, and, and for the existing sort of insurance and financing systems not to be barriers to that, that's going to be at least part of the equation is that kind of product development. Um, and, it's not, and it's more than measurement, and it's more than just predictive models. So, right. um, you know. And I would imagine that weather obviously is a big factor, you know, especially in states like Florida where we deal with uh, natural disasters such as hurricanes often. Um, that must definitely factor in when it comes down to understanding how, how, how all this plays in. Is, is, am I correct in that? Weather is always in the model, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and is it more of an impact, especially in states such as Florida that deal with natural disasters on a regular basis? I mean, I mean, it really depends on what the application is, right? I mean, certainly um, every agricultural sort of market is subject to some kind of weather, unless you're in a controlling your environment, of course. Well, then um, you're also dependent on the yeah. weather if power goes out and not properly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Krishna, uh, how important is access to real-time or near real-time information for your users? I think, I think you know, we, we promised to the industry that we will improve the political value for them. And for that, we are going to make you data driven, and that real time. If you look at one, one end of the spectrum, is this, uh, all the farmers who are on the platform. And the right hand side, all the you know, enterprise, government, development agencies who are working closely with this ecosystem to improve the poico value. So the, both, both the side need the real time information. For example, a farmer needs uh, information in terms of how much fertigation I should do today, because my plant is 10 days old 
and this is the bezel dose I required at, at this particular farm. And then the company requires information that they are managing 10,000 farmers you know, in multi-production sites, like in multi-states multi or multi-country. What's the health of those, those farms and how much I can expect out of that? Because I have a commitment in processing or to my customers. So it's become very, very critical for this data to flow both the ways. I'll give you an example. In India, we have got the largest insurance program for the smallholders. So there are 140 million farmers in the country. Right. Now to benchmark the yield of the gram panchayat. So gram panchayat is a cluster of villages. So you can't do a one and one insurance to the farmer. So this is a group insurance is done by the government and the insurance companies. So it's a region. And if the, if the yield of that region goes below a certain threshold, every, every farmer gets the payout. If it goes above, nobody gets the payout. Now to measure that yield benchmark, there are 7 million manual crop cutting experiments happening across the country, 7 million, within the window of two months. And that data is fuzzed, because manually you are going and entering, and based on some local leaders, they will change the numbers so that farmer gets the you know, payouts and they will get the votes. Right? So a lot of those kind of things happen, and the insurance company doesn't want to pay because they know there's something wrong happened. And the farmer gets the payout in, after one year. So imagine his crop failed today, but he's getting a payout after one year because all this you know, information loss is there. Now, what we have done for the government is uh, we are giving the yield benchmark using our machine learning and data platform, which is AI-led. AI and we are saying, in this Gram Panchayat, the, your, your yield, look, yield look almost homogeneous, so you need to do only one crop cutting experiment. And here is too much variance based on the crop health. You should do three and four. So we, have, we brought down the cost by 40%. So seven million became five million. And slowly, it will reduce to zero. But right. then nobody can adopt technology you know, as of today. They will see over a period of three years and then get comfortable and they will start using it. So I think this is the power of you know, real-time information. And the payout can happen tomorrow. So once you have that information and everybody relies partly to that technology, then you know, the moment information comes in, then the farmer gets the money tomorrow. Right? Great. So that's one of the examples I can share with you. Thank you, Krishna. Um, so we got basically around three minutes left, and I'm going to leave you all with a group question here, um, starting with, with Chris. Uh, what digital transformation, oh, I'm sorry, with digital transformation in agriculture on the rise, how can producers best roll out um, and scale its use of new technologies? Chris? Oof, that's a good question. Um, you got one minute. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pass and let those guys I'll come back to me. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. How about Josh? So, yeah, sure. I think one thing is just, you know, using the technology. I mean, there's a reason that it takes time for, you know, uptake in the market on this stuff. Uh, for example, even just basic profit mapping, there's a lot of growers that have the equipment that still don't do that, surprisingly. Um, and if you want to do, you know, oftentimes it's really ironic. We find that, you know, we'll show a grower a profit map and they'll say, wow. And then we'll say, well, what did your agronomist say? And they said, oh, they said don't use VRT. We're like, the agronomist said that? I mean, it's <laughs> shocking. Um, so I think part of it is just like, as that diffuses, diffuses into the market. And then also, um, I think expect a lot of um, you know, uh, financial you know, innovations on the finance side. For example, um, automating the appraisal process, automating the loss adjustment process on crop insurance, for example, uh, so you can get your claims sooner. Um, all of those sorts of things, I think, are really still sort of in their infancy in some ways, even in the U.S. Um, so I suspect that it won't be that the grower will have to do everything. Um, I think as some of these technologies develop and, and a lot of the financial institutions start to use them, it'll become more normal, I think. So. Well, um, will affordability also um, start to... It's, a, it's always an issue, and the growers don't <laughs> often want to pay for this stuff. So yeah. uh, oftentimes it's, you know... Um, other institutions that are that are kind of driving it, and uh, you've seen increased adoption. Part of that is also just part of the normal progression of, you know, I've always done it this way versus um, I'm taking over the farm and I want to try new things. Right. Um, so I think that's all kind of part of the natural process. So. Okay. Yeah. So education obviously plays a big role as well. Yeah. With farmers. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, thank yeah. you. Perfect. Um, Naim, uh, we have uh, less than a minute. I guess you can uh, finish this one up. Well, what can I say? Which will be relevant in less than a minute. I think the main point is you guys have seen in this panel and all the discussion we had this morning, there's a lot of power in data. If we can collect the data, we can help improve yield, what to grow, when to harvest, how to treat it post-harvest. But there's a lot of reluctance to share the data. People, especially large company, hoard data. We are having all kinds of issues trying to get data out of people. What we don't realize is we are living on one planet, guys. Hello. 
And the data will help all of us. So I think there's an awareness, which hopefully will start with this room and go beyond, that sharing data about crop, storage, spoilage will help all of you. So don't break that silos, pun intended, post-harvest silos. <laughs> but break the silos and share the data because there's a collective bigger good. And I think that point is lost and not often articulated. Thank you, Naeem. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I hope you all enjoyed this uh, panel on crop management. Thank you to everyone here today. Please talk about applause to everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.